I'd like to tell you and talk to you about something that really is important to me, and I hope it's also important to you as well. And if it's not, I hope by the end of this talk you'll have a, maybe a, something to think about that maybe when you wake up tomorrow after a sort of nice sleep, you think, actually, yes, I believe in what Sam's saying too. Um, and I'll start off by saying something probably quite stupid um, that, that, that you think, why is Sam asking that question? But it's, it's, it's a question that had been asked before, but the answers were very different. So hands up if you can read or write. All right? I've got all the hands up. Not everyone's, but some people aren't putting their hands up over here. <laughs> That's a bit strange. Okay, so I ask this, this question at schools all the time. So I do, I do this kind of talk in schools a lot. And they all put their hands up, obviously. And then I say, hands up if, so you all, you're all adults, right? So hand up if you are already, or you're considering a career, a professional career, as a writer. That's some of you, right? Some of you, but not many. So the rest of you who learn to read or write, why have you bothered? <laughs> What was that about, right? So I asked this, I, asked, I was in Duxford talking to 200 uh, primary school kids on Tuesday. And I asked this question, why, why do you bother to read or write if you're not going to become a professional writer? And the answers were beautiful. One girl said, because I can express myself. Right? It's a beautiful thing. Another girl said, because it's important to be able to, to read so I can actually read contracts. Right? So if I have a job, I know what am I getting into, right? Well, we all click the I agree every time we do something online, so we're not necessarily using that skill. Right? And another person said, this is fantastic, um, because when I'm doing something, I want to be able to remember it for later. So I'll write it down, right? and then I can go back to it later and read it again. Well, this is academic papers. You know? this, is, this is us writing a to-do list. Right? These are all important skills. Another girl said, so I can keep a diary. Okay? And then and another girl said, uh, and she did this whole long-winded thing, it was quite, quite interesting to hear, but the, the essence was that uh, she, she can read or write, so if someone else can't, then it's her duty, really, to help them because they're disadvantaged. Okay? So, so not so long ago, we were saying, if I asked the question, most people wouldn't put their hand up because most people couldn't read or write. And so why would you bother? Well, I work on the farm. I don't need to learn to read or write. I, that's not an important thing for me. But clearly today, it's not an acceptable position, really, to say, I don't get reading or writing. It's not for me, right? Because it's so fundamentally useful. Now, I'm going to make the argument, it's the same for programming, and it's the same for coding. Now, you'll hear all the time, especially today, coding's important. You need to learn to code because you can get a job as a professional programmer, right? That's not why you should learn to code. In the same way, you don't learn to read or write to become a professional reader or a professional writer. Some of you might do, some of you might become professional programmers, some kids I speak to may become professional programmers, but that's not why everyone should do it. Um, and so I just wanted to get that, that laid down as a, as, a, as a fundamental thing to talk about. And so when we start talking about why we should learn to, to code, we need to think about how we can do it, you know, and, and, and why. So the whys are the same as reading and writing. You can be you can be amazing expressive with code. You can remember things with code, specifically process, how to do stuff. Code is amazing at describing and capturing process. Okay, so there's lots of things, and we're going to be able to, uh, um, we'll be able to, so what were the other examples? So we'll be able to remember things, we'll be able to uh, store things, we'll be able to express ourselves. And then the other thing is, the other funny thing, is that people who can't code are disadvantaged. Think about that. Like most of you guys now are in that category. So you can probably do something about it. And why would you do something about it? Because it's so amazing, and you can express yourselves in ways you could never imagine. Right? And, and that's the disadvantage. It's not a disadvantage as in your lives aren't great right now. I'm sure they're all fantastic lives. But they could be better right? if you learn to code. Um, and so I built, and I'm not just a joke, right? I'm really, really, really serious about this. So I built a tool that allows me to demonstrate that code is creative. Uh, here it is, you can see on the screen. And uh, uh, I've got, I'm going to try and, I'm going to, hold on, jump around the stage. I'm going to rearrange the stage for my own purposes. Is this here long enough? Right. So this is the computer up down here. Right, there's a the screen. Now, this computer I'm using here, uh, I'm just going to close some of these windows, is this computer called a Raspberry Pi. Has anyone here heard of a Raspberry Pi? So, yep, fantastic. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi here. And when I do my performances, I use a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and the reason is that I'm trying to lower the barrier to a creative experience with code. And uh, I've described why I think it's important. I've described why I think code is an important thing. But 
Uh, this computer here, does anyone know how much it costs to buy a Raspberry Pi? Yeah? 30 quid. Exactly, 30 pounds. Okay, 30, depending on where you buy it from. And then this is it here, this is a little gizmo. It's a very small little device. And you can plug it into your television. And you just get, you bring along a keyboard and mouse, you just find it from somewhere, there's loads of them everywhere. Uh, and away you go, you can start to learn how to code. Now, the system I've written doesn't just run on a Raspberry Pi, it runs on a normal PC or a Mac. So if you already have a computer, use that. You can code on those computers. But if you don't, or if you want to explore a different kind of computer, the Raspberry Pi is an amazing system to play with. And, and this is the important word, to play. OK, so I built my program. It runs, actually, it's on default. If I go like here, I can go to programming. And down there is the Sonic Pi. Uh, and I can click on that, and I'll open up Sonic Pi. And away we go. And so I'm going to show you how you can use this. So this system here looks like a text editor or like a Word document. But actually, it's a new musical instrument. Okay, and it's a musical instrument that kids can learn, and it's a musical instrument that can make music that kids care about. Because how many kids listen to music with violins in? How many? How many kids listen to music with clarinets in or pianos? Right? How many kids listen to music which is actually really reliably notated on a Western score? Not very many. Okay, and so why in schools are we teaching these old school instruments as the primary medium for music? It's nuts. Okay, because to me, what's the goal is once we've decided it's important, we need to find ways to motivate people, ways for them to care. And, that, and for that, for me, it's about having something that, that actually matters in their lives. Right, so what matters in people's lives? Making some beeps. So let's do that, right? So the simplest thing, and also trying to lower the barrier to entry, is how do I make the first sound in, in a musical instrument? Well, the piano, I just whack the keys, right? With the violin, I hit the bow on the strings, and I can make some sort of sound. In Sonic Pi, you've got to write a word, and this word is called play, because I'm going to actually have some fun. And uh, can you read that at the back? Is that visible? Uh, and then I choose a number to play. So uh, 80 is quite high. There we are. We're going to hear that. Oh, there we are. That's, that's my musical instrument playing for the first time. You've all heard it, so I'm sure you'll appreciate that it's glory. Um, <laughs> but what you really need to appreciate at this point is that it's so simple to make that sound. I just write the word play, and I choose a number. Now, this is programming. I'm writing a piece of code. This is my first program. It's a fully complete program. It's got functions. It's got uh, uh, arguments. It's got abstractions. So if you're going in a school, you've got all different ways to actually teach all these things. And one of the key abstractions is the number, right? So we've had some maths talks earlier. Um, this is my math spiel. What's great about numbers is they can go up and they can go down. That's, that's good, right? So, and the cool thing is that you can, if you take that idea, you can map it onto other things which also happen to go up and happen to go down. So in music, what happens to go up and goes down is pitch. Yeah. So if I change the number to be a different number, like 50, which is down from 80, and get a note, which is down from 50. Well, I don't need to care what those numbers mean. I can, if I want to. And I can go and study it, and I can go and figure out that that's the 50th note on the piano. But as a kid, I don't need to care about that. I just want to find a number I like. Maybe I don't like that one, so I like, maybe I like this one. Right? That's pretty cool. Or maybe I want to go nuts, and I'm like, well, maybe I can do like somewhere like that, in between the two. Right? So I can play any number I want. Right? That's, that's fine. And kids will go nuts. So like, they'll say, well, what about like, Eight billion, trillion, zillion, million, right? And you, oh, I make a mistake. And then, obviously, so that's an opportunity for learning. You start to talk about the audible range, and this actually is a note that's probably not producible by the speakers, but if it was, you couldn't hear it because your ears don't work in a way that, that perceives the high frequencies. Maybe bats could hear that. Um, so, and actually, it's funny, on Twitter the other day, some guy was saying, I've been annoying the hell out of my dog with really high beeps. <laughs> and all he was doing was choosing big numbers like this, right? I actually have no idea what time I've got left because the screen's gone. Um, OK, so um, once we've got this, then, then there's a matter of making melodies, right? So I play note 80, then I play note 50, and then I play note uh, whatever. What's the go for like 65? Let's go crazy, right? Oh, actually, that's not what I expected. I expected him to play one, then the other, then the other. Well, in Sonic Pi, it doesn't actually, I mean, obviously, I didn't expect that because I wrote the system, so I'm just lying to you. Um, but you might have expected that. And so the deal with this is that uh, uh, when Sonic Pi, when you, when, you make a, when you put multiple lines like this, it does them all at the same time. Bang. Okay, absolutely the same time. You can see on the right-hand side, at time zero, I play the synth beep with those different parameters. So when you put multiple play statements, I mean, I'm, I'm teaching you how to use this. So when you go home, you can doubt this. It's totally free software. It's open source. 
Uh, so you're free to play with it and free to download it. Um, so when you all go home and you play with this, you'll realize that this is quite a nice way of doing chords. But if you want to make a melody, you need to learn one more command, and that's sleep. So I'm going to sleep for half a second here, sleep for one second here, and now I've got my melody. Beautiful, right? Now, the cool thing about this is, with these two commands, I have most of Western notation. So most scores you can see with dots and lines, I have most of that. Right? So I can do Bach and Beethoven and Mozart with those two commands. More importantly, kids can do that. And even more importantly for you guys, you can do this. Because right? this is for everybody, it's not just for kids. So with those two commands, I can make any melody I can possibly imagine. Albeit with a beep sound, which is not maybe the best thing you want to hear, but you can totally do this. And so kids are taking Frozen tracks and they're re-rendering it with Play and Sleep or their favourite nursery rhymes or whatever they want to do. So with those two commands you can have a lot of fun. And that's most in Western notation. And the thing is, with code, this is just the start. This is nothing that we can... This is, I'm going to show you something from that which is going to blow your minds off. Because I can take this system and I can play it in nightclubs. Last Friday, I was in uh, the Glasgow Art School playing in a nightclub with this system. I wasn't doing doop boop boop, right? <laughs> I could have done that, but, I, but it wouldn't have gone down particularly well. Um, and, so, and, yeah, and, and so the thing is to, to think about what the progression is. So if I start here, how, where can I go? And what can I show the kids where they can go? And so the other thing is, it's really important to think about uh, engaging the kids in ways that um, are meaningful to them. So, uh, when we talk about code, one might think one thing kids have like a, a clear relationship with is gaming and games. And so this is an example of a friend Tim Reagan gave to me a while back, and he said that the problem with games is that kids have super high expectations. Right? So they'll say, you say to them, let's make a game, right? I can code, we can sit together, we can use like the Raspberry Pi, we can make a game. Should we do that? And the kids are like super excited and pumped. And they sit down and he says to them, What kind of game would you like? And he's like, Well, I'm on a horse. I'm looking on a hill, I'm looking down at a castle, and I've got my army behind me, and we're going to siege the castle, right? And I'm going to strategize the attack, and I'm going to choose which the horses are going to go first, and I'm, I'm going to choose. And you're thinking, well, I can do you a square. <laughs> that could be the castle. And I could do like triangles for the horses and circles for the cannons, and the kids like, whatever. And they've lost, you've lost their attention, right? Because their expectations are crazy high. So with music, we can do beats like this, but really they want to be able to play, well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be able to play something like the loop arm end break, right? So get some drums going, right? So one line, I've got the loop arm end break. I can take any sample from anywhere and play it back in the system. Uh, just be aware, guys, I don't know what the time is, how long I've got left, because the screen isn't working. So I'm going to keep talking to someone tell me to stop. Um, I would appreciate if I had like a three minute warning. Um, so once I've got this, then the thing is, how do I do actually something musical with it, right? So the, the next thing is to think about loops and structures. I've invented something called the live loop, uh, which I'll just call it beats. And I'm going to play that sample, the loop arm end break. And I'm going to sleep for one length of the break. And then I'm going to, uh, but if I try this, right, so if I sleep for one second between the arm end breaks, it's not going to sound so good. Gonna, they're all mashing together, right? Because the length of the arm end break isn't one second, it's longer than that, right? So it doesn't, doesn't sort of nicely uh, tessellate together in time. So what I can do is change time. So if I use sample BPM and change it to be the same as the loop arm end, it means now that sleeping for one is sleeping for one duration of loop arm end, right? So now, right, it's working, right? So now I've got this thing, I can start and stop. And so far, you've seen me use Sonic Pi in composition mode. Right, so I've been writing some text, pressing the run button, using a shortcut, but essentially pressing the run button, and then you hear that composition play until I'm bored and I stop it. Right? The thing about Sonic Pi is, the exciting part is I can actually change it whilst it's running. So this live loop is not a construct you'll see in any other programming language. It's, it's the Sam Aaron thing. I'm really, really pleased and proud of it. It's, it's a live loop because it allows you to change the loop live as it's playing. So let's hear that. So I get it going. And I think, well, maybe I want to do some like a uh, straight out of Compton, NWA, like rap music, rather than like Bristol drum and bass. So let's change the rate to be a half. Press the run button. Next time round, it's kicking in, right? So now I can start rapping on top, yo yo. Um, I can't really do rapping, so that's, I'll leave that. And then I can go back into fast drum and bass. 
right, and it's going, and then I maybe want to mash it up, so I'll play it in reverse, right, and then maybe I want to get some bass in there. Right, and maybe I want to slice it up. Right, so as I'm changing the text, the music is changing, right? This is a new musical instrument for making electronic music that anyone can play with and anyone can use. And you don't have to make drone based stuff like this. You can make crazy sounds. So I can like, this is a cool sample of the ambient choir. It's funny, I do this in schools, right? And I do this. And the kids are like, oh, that's a bit rubbish, isn't it? Oh. You think, well, yeah, it's not that great. It's not like, down. it's not wicked sounds. But the cool thing about sounds is you can stretch them and manipulate them and morph them. So you saw with this rate thing, I can change how, how long the sample is. So this rate basically says play it at half speed. Right, so you think about that, if I'm walking normal speed, da -da 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 -da, that's pretty good. Or if I walk at twice the speed, da -da 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 -da, I get to the end really quickly, twice as fast. Or if I play, if I walk at half speed, da -da 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 -da, I get there twice as long. And so if I change the rate to be the choir of half speed, it takes twice as long. But also because I'm stretching it out like a slinky, what ha actually happens to the sound waves is it reduces it by an octave. So you get a lower sound, which is for longer. And so if I change it to like 0.25, it's quite nice, right? And I'll do something with that in a minute, but I actually, whilst I've got this idea in my head of walking, one thing I show the kids all the time is if I get, this, get the loop arm end thing, you saw I did something crazy, I did the minus one. So what do you think that means? If I'm walking forward at one speed of one, that's pretty good. But what happens if I walk at the speed of minus one? Going backwards. That's pretty cool, right? So what does that sound like? And just the, the sound of a sound playing backwards, like blows people, I didn't realize that what, that's what that sound was. Like, this, people do this all the time. They play sounds backwards, right? So uh, going back to the, uh, the, the choir thing, right? So I can do this with a live loop, and I can get something completely different effect. So let's, let's call this live loop foo. Each live loop needs a name to be distinct. Uh, and then I can sleep for one second. So I've got a nice effect, like some nice, cool effect. How many lines of code are there? Four. OK, right, that's lovely. Um, and then I can start to mess around with this. So I can say, like, uh, if I can type correctly, just change your rate down a little bit. Oh, what a lovely effect that is, right? Yeah. And maybe I want to drop it down to, like, an eighth. So you can sit and you can meditate, and it's not a joke, actually. I sit for hours just tweaking these numbers, because it's a beautiful thing to do. Because music is not just about listening. It's not about listening to Taylor Swift, right? It's not about listening to, well, let's think of some of my favorite bands, Smashing Pumpkins, right? Like old school bands. It is that, but it's also about creating it in your limited selves, right? So you need to get off your bottoms, you need to get into your homes, get some Sonic Pi going and make your own music. Because that's way more fun. Especially when you've got your mates around and sitting around. And I go off into a cafe, get, get my, I usually ones on a laptop, just get the laptop out, headphone splitters, two sets of headphones, sit together and jam. It's just amazing. You can take it in turns to change the music. And it really is so much fun. Right? Because you are creating the music, and you're not having the music created for you. You're in control. Right? So uh, I've got four minutes left. I'm going to show you. So, this is, these are the very simple things, and, and the, cool, the, other, the other cool thing is that, let's go back to some, uh, let's go to some more dance music. I'm going to end with some like fast music, if that's okay. Um, the loop industrial track uh, is actually quite nice. These are all, these samples which come involved, are, come installed are Creative Commons Zero samples. So they're all free, uh, completely free, restriction free, uh, so you can make music and, uh, that you can sell and, and, and use these samples freely. But you can also bring your own, you can record your own. Kids love recording their head headmistress shouting in the corridors, playing it back half speed in reverse. You know, so you can totally do that. So here we've got this drum track. Right, so again, we've got this problem of the sample's not quite in beats. So we can fix that by stretching it. No, that's good, right? So that's good. So whilst that's going, I can then live loop. Um, well, let's just stop it for a moment because it's. Slightly irritating. Um, and then let's get some beats here. 
and I can play the sample bass drum house, and I can sleep that for half a second. So one's going every second, the other one's going twice as fast, right? And so we can hear what that sounds like. And I think, well, that's quite nice, but maybe they make the, the bass drum a bit louder. Right, we're getting there, we're getting some music. And again, we have the same thing we can do. So once you've got this going, then it's a matter of thinking about what melodies do I have on top, what, what can I play with it. So we had that play sleep stuff before. So um, we can take something like another live loop and we can call like vortex and we can say let's get some notes, uh, notes be like some scale, what's a good scale to pick from, E3 minor type pentatonic, well mixolydian, no, no, let's not go for that one, minor pentatonic. And then I can say play notes dot choose, just choose a random note, the short release time of 0.1, so a very short note, and then sleep for a very small amount of time. And then I can start changing the synths, uh, change a cut off. Right, so with just three live loops, you're creating something which is sounding a bit musical. And I've just not got up very quickly, right? So I, I haven't really thought about it in much detail. But the cool thing about Sonic Pi is I can go to the help page, and this thing pops up below, and there's a whole bunch of these examples. So you can look from Haunted Bells, which is just a, three lines of code, so cut and paste. These are starting points, right? So I can create some like, nice sound. I can mix these together. Maybe with some oceans. Right? Or I can like do some dance music. So this is 35 lines of code. Right? That's not very blip. This is it, right? This is all the code. That's it there, making that music. Or this is the, the one I wrote like last week. So this is, I'm showing you the demo version. Like I haven't released this particular version yet, but I'm really pleased. I was listening to some Daft Punk, and uh, it was the Tron album. There was a track on there called Derezzed. It was pretty wicked. So I was thinking, can I reproduce it in Sonic Pi or something similar? So I had a go, and where are we? Uh, can anyone see? I can't read my screen. There we are. Derezzed. There we are. Um, and so this has just got three parts, as we saw before. Let's make this slightly bigger so we can read it. Um, Let's just comment out some stuff, and I'll end on this. So we've got the, the thing we heard before, like the loop industrial and the bass drum house. And then I can add some, some saw synths and make them play random things. Sit in chairs, get the going, come on. Right? And this is the, this is the thing that you could do today. All right, my time's up now, so I just want to very quickly finish by saying that uh, the thing I, that annoys the hell out of me when I go to schools is lots of teachers say to me, and I really shouldn't say this because it's, it's, loads of teachers are amazing, but lots of teachers say to me, I don't get technology. And they often say it with a proud face. <laughs> and it's just like saying, I don't get reading or writing. That is not acceptable, is it? And so I think it's OK to say you don't get technology if you haven't really had the time or the inclination to learn it. So what's most important is if you, if you find yourself saying that, or you, you hear someone saying that, you must say no. You need to add a dot, sorry, a comma, and a yet, because there's still time to get technology. 
And it should not be acceptable to say you don't get it because it's the most fantastically creative tool we have available us today. And especially if teachers are sitting in a cultural context where not getting technology is acceptable in our schools today, that is really cutting their futures off from the most exciting lives. And so we should all be getting technology, we should all be playing with it, we should all be having fun, and we should all be sharing what we do with others. Thank you very much.